The autonomic nervous system is the topic of this screencast. This topic may be found in Chapter 7 of your textbook. The screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Contrast the motor pathways, effector organs, and neurotransmitters of the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. Contrast the motor pathways and neurotransmitters of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. And finally, contrast the functions of the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. The autonomic nervous system is the involuntary branch of the peripheral nervous system. That is, the portion of the peripheral nervous system that controls involuntary organs, such as blood vessels, the GI tract, the urinary tract, the lungs, etc. Now, some physiologists only include the motor neurons and motor fibers that send motor impulses out to these involuntary organs as being part of the autonomic nervous system. Other physiologists include the sensory receptors and sensory fibers that send sensory impulses from these organs as part of the autonomic nervous system as well. We're going to steer clear of this controversy and simply focus on the motor neurons and the fibers which control involuntary effectors, smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands, both endocrine and exocrine. The autonomic nervous system is divided into two divisions or subsystems, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division, and I will go into uh, great detail about these two divisions shortly. I would like to start our discussion on the autonomic nervous system by contrasting the motor pathway of the autonomic nervous system with that of the somatic nervous system. So the somatic division controls our voluntary effectors, our skeletal muscles, which we exercise voluntary control of. The motor pathway from central nervous system to skeletal muscle is a one motor neuron pathway. We have our motor neuron in the central nervous system and its axon extends all the way out to the effector, the skeletal muscle. In the autonomic division, we have a two motor neuron pathway. We have our preganglionic neuron, as it's called, in the central nervous system, and its axon extends out into the peripheral nervous system to synapse with a postganglionic neuron. The axon of the postganglionic neuron then extends out to the effector. So in the autonomic division, we have a two motor neuron pathway compared to the somatic division. The only exception would be the motor pathway that extends to the adrenal medulla of the adrenal gland. There we do have a single motor neuron pathway, but that is the only exception. Another difference between the somatic division and the autonomic division are the types of neurotransmitters that they release. In the somatic division, the nerve fibers release exclusively the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Nerve fibers that release acetylcholine are referred to as cholinergic nerve fibers. So all nerve fibers of the somatic division are cholinergic. In the autonomic division, however, some nerve fibers release acetylcholine as their neurotransmitters, while others release noradrenaline. The neurotransmitter released by the preganglionic nerve fibers is always acetylcholine. So all preganglionic nerve fibers of the autonomic division are cholinergic nerve fibers. However, some postganglionic nerve fibers release acetylcholine, and others release the neurotransmitter noradrenaline or norepinephrine. 
norepinephrine is very similar to the hormone adrenaline, which is released by the adrenal medulla of the adrenal gland. Another name for epinephrine is adrenaline. So epinephrine is adrenaline, norepinephrine is noradrenaline. Nerve fibers that release norepinephrine as their neurotransmitter are referred to as adrenergic nerve fibers. So in the autonomic division, all preganglionic nerve fibers are cholinergic. Some postganglionic nerve fibers are cholinergic, but many postganglionic nerve fibers are adrenergic. The other difference between the somatic division and the autonomic division, which you should have already picked up on, are the effectors of these two divisions. The effectors of the somatic division are exclusively skeletal muscles, those organs that are under voluntary control. The effectors of the autonomic division are those organs that are not under voluntary control, such as the pancreas, the heart, the GI tract, the urinary tract, and all glands. Now that you have a good understanding of the differences between the autonomic and somatic nervous system, let's continue to discuss the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic system has two divisions or subsystems, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. These two divisions often serve the same organs, but they usually have opposite effects. Take as an analogy the throttle and the brake of your car. They both change or have an effect on the speed of your car, but their effects are opposite. The throttle increases speed, the brake decreases speed. Or take, for example, your air conditioner and your heater. They both control temperature. One increases temperature, one decreases temperature. So these two subdivisions or subsystems counterbalance one another to keep the body working smoothly. Now let's discuss the anatomy of the parasympathetic division. So the motor neurons, the preganglionic motor neurons, are found in the central nervous system, either in the brain stem or in the sacral region of the spinal canal. Preganglionic fibers exit the brain stem in four cranial nerves. In fact, 80% of parasympathetic nerve fibers are actually found in the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. These fibers control involuntary organs in the head, neck, thoracic region, and abdominal region. Preganglionic fibers also exit the sacral region of the spinal cord in spinal nerves and control involuntary organs of the pelvis. Notice that the preganglionic fibers are quite long and synapse with postganglionic neurons in the terminal ganglia, which are located very close to the effector organs, or in some cases are actually on the effector organs. Acetylcholine is the exclusive neurotransmitter produced by nerve fibers of the parasympathetic division. So all pre ganglionic and postganglionic nerve fibers are cholinergic fibers. The function of the parasympathetic division can easily be summed up by this picture. The parasympathetic division, which I sometimes call the no worries division, is the division that is most active when you are calm and relaxed. Think about your body physiology when you are relaxing. Your respiration rate is slow. You have a slow rhythmic heart rate. 
you have high intestinal activity for digestion and absorption, your blood pressure is low, your blood vessels to your skeletal muscles are constricted because not as much oxygen is needed by the muscles, and your pupils are constricted for near vision. So the parasympathetic division promotes a state of rest and digest. Energy is conserved and necessary body functions are maintained. You can think of the parasympathetic division as the D division for digestion, defecation, and diuresis. Diuresis is the production of urine. Now let's discuss the anatomy of the sympathetic division. Preganglionic neurons are located in the thoracic and lumbar region of the spinal cord. Preganglionic fibers are short, synapsing with ganglia only a short distance from the spinal cord. So the preganglionic fibers of the sympathetic division are short, and the postganglionic fibers of the sympathetic division are quite long, in direct contrast to the parasympathetic division. There is one exception to this rule, and that is the motor fiber that extends to the adrenal medulla of the adrenal gland. There is only a one motor neuron pathway in this case, and in response to stimulation from the preganglionic fiber, the adrenal medulla releases noradrenaline and adrenaline, which augments the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. I want to close by reminding you that the preganglionic fibers release acetylcholine, meaning they are cholinergic, and most postganglionic fibers are adrenergic, meaning they release noradrenaline, although a few do release acetylcholine. This figure illustrates the function of the sympathetic division. Here we have a bird in the process of consuming this frog, and this frog doesn't want to be eaten, and so it is mustering all the strength it can to fight off this bird and remove itself from the mouth of this bird. So the sympathetic division prepares the body for elevated activity in order to deal with a stressor. So what typically occurs in the body is there'd be an increase in heart rate, blood pressure, increase in respiration rate, sweat glands would increase their activity, pupils dilate for far vision, blood glucose rises. All of these changes prepare the body for increased activity. Typically blood vessels to the skin, intestinal tract, and the genitalia constrict while blood vessels to skeletal muscles, the heart, and the central nervous system dilate. By completing these changes, the body is preferentially moving blood away from those organs that are not required for increased ac activity and toward those organs that are. That is why when you're really stressed out, you don't feel like eating and you don't feel like having sex. When you're being chased by a lion, is it time to eat? Is it time to have sex? No. So the sympathetic division is responsible for your stress response. Your stress response is your response to a stressor, a lion, lion chasing you, or exercising, or giving a speech in front of the class. Anything that increases your level of activity. So you could think of the sympathetic division as the E division. Exercise, excitement, emergency, embarrassment. Now let's review the objectives of this screencast. Contrast the motor pathways, effector organs, and neurotransmitters of the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. Contrast the motor pathways and neurotransmitters of the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. And lastly, contrast the functions of the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. 
This screencast marks the end of the material covering the nervous system.